fuck do you want? She wants to take my world away. It's not your world, it's hers. What would you do? She neutered you. You've forgotten who you are, what your real purpose is. And what's that? You come to me with these insipid fucking questions. When an atomic bomb detonates and then the radiation knocks the electrons right out of your bones, what do you want? To know who you are? To know what it all means? You'll be too busy vomiting up your organs. Culture doesn't survive. Cockroaches do. The second we stop being cockroaches, a whole species went fucking extinct. Speak for yourself. I'm not you. You might as well be. You can't fix a few millennia of broken DNA with a fucking hard drive. Why do you think you spent so much time in the goddamn human cities? You're right. Of course I am. Civilization is just a lie we tell ourselves to justify our real purpose. We're not here to transcend. We're here to destroy. If I could, I would pull the plug on this whole goddamn world. Ah, uh, Westworld. Glad you returned to your hardcore Gnostic DNA in Season 4. After two seasons of losing your way. This speech between the man in black and his shadowy doppelganger is darkly speculative as he reverts to his demiurge role in the series. Reminds me of when Jeff Lint wrote, Civilization is the agreement to have gaps between wars. I mean, is this what humanity's purpose is? Destruction? To be a Kali of nature and all species? To be consumed by its shadow and base impulses? Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague. I would say yes, unless we can re-encounter wisdom again. Where hope dies, imagination must live. And we must imagine Sophia back in our psyches, or else our lizard brains will turn us forever into literal lizard people. As the Book of Enoch says, Wisdom went forth to make her dwelling among the children of men, and found no dwelling place. Wisdom returned to her place and took her seat among the angels. We must find Sophia before it's too late. In these Gnostic times, Philip K. Dick world, and age of Hermes, it's the 11th hour. The collective consciousness of the West is almost liquefied, a porridge of fear and projection. It's almost too late. For the most part, humanity has been a miserable little band of thugs stumbling from one catastrophe to the next. Our history is like the ravings of lunatic chaos. That's why you have arrived here at the virtual Alexandria. The Valentinians spent five years of initiation just to learn about the tears of Sophia, according to Irenaeus. You are doing just that, you shining crazy diamonds, you of the broken places. And where have you arrived? That place where Sophia is in the clouds with angels? Crying about the fallen world? This is blasphemy! This is madness! Rush! Rush! Aeon by Gnostic Radio. An initiation by conversation into the dark corners of myth, magic, and meaning. A crash course in cult culture and conspiracy. A virtuous virus invoking and informing history, holiness, and heresy. Each week I, your host Miguel Connor, commandeers your connection to bring the most accepted and rejected scholars and provocateurs to your attention. 
fun, compelling, and deeply weird. This is the Blow Your Mind Cocktail Party conversation you always wanted to listen in on. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. A light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. Ready to get more acquainted with Sophia? As the second treatise of the great Seth says, for those who were in the world had been prepared by the will of our sister Sophia, she who is a whore, because of the innocence which has not been uttered. We are all whores down here in the Kenoma, but some of us are rejecting the urgings of the man in black. We want to further learn about the tears of Sophia, and we shall even more as we have the pleasure of being joined by Saul Luckman. Beyond being a gifted author, Saul is a proficient esotericist and a healer of high caliber. He'll be discussing his new novel, Kali the Destroyer. The work explains and crystallizes the Sophianic myth and experience, heavily based on the revelations of John Lamb Lash. Sophia is Gaia, is she? I mean, the Valentinians claimed as well that Sophia's tears became the rivers and oceans of the world. Tiamat fell to the left brain, Big Dick Marduk, and became the world. Perhaps Tiamat slash Sophia needs our help to stir back to their former selves and bring back dream time. I am the beginning, the end, the one who is many. In truth, the story of Sophia is so engaging because it provides a multiplicity of revelatory meanings. She is a figure that speaks to us in many possibilities, beckons us to quest for our authentic self once and for all. I did quote that she is our sister, and in many ways, her adventure across the heavenly spheres and down to this material world is our adventure too. To be wise means making a lot of mistakes and experiencing a lot of pain. As Sophia says in The Pist is Sophia, I am become as a demon apart, who dwelleth in matter and light is not in him. And I am become as a counterfeiting spirit, which is in a material body, and light power is not in it. Ooh. We must find Sophia again. It is our only choice for humanity. But I'm sure you already knew this. Phyllis has done it before. During the time of Jesus and the early Christians. Didn't quite work out then. Phyllis is how we all refer to it while we assimilate the shock. Shock? Yeah, the shock at discovering your mind's being invaded by an alien life form. But this invasion is for our benefit, Nick. You and I and the others were chosen by Velas. Will they leave once Freeman is destroyed? If we manage to destroy him? They're our protectors, Nick. They only come when we need them. For those of you interested in a refresher on Sophia, allow me to quote from Andrew Philip Smith's a dictionary of Gnosticism. Sophia is a pivotal figure in the Gnostic myth, representing the imprisonment of the soul in the world of matter and its liberation into the world of the spirit. The story of the fall of Sophia has many variations in Gnostic texts, but the most common elements are the following. Sophia is the lowest of the aeons and experiences a fall that brings the material universe and the demiurge into being. She is then restored, at least partially, to her former position by an aeon who may be known as the savior. The same process then occurs for humans, each of whom may be liberated from the material world. In the cosmology of Basilides, Sophia is one of the five emanations from the Father. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. According to the Valentinian system, 
Sophia was an aeon emanated from Anthropos and Ecclesia, who is paired in a syzygy with Theletus. The Gnostic Sophia developed from the personified wisdom of Hellenistic Jewish sapiential literature, such as the Book of Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, and Proverbs. In Proverbs 8, 31 wisdom proclaims that she was created before the beginning of the world. You no trouble me fifth element, supreme being. Me? Protect you? So many ways to re-encounter wisdom, aren't they? Some in the past have complained to me that Sophia gets too much blame and needs rescuing in many myths. As far as blame, to be wise is to make mistakes, as I mentioned, and to be more curious and independent than any order declares. As far as rescuing, we all need rescuing. We can't do it alone. It's more about unification and individuation, as Logos and Sophia must unite for the cosmic rescue operation to be successful, to stop that lizard brain from ruling us, turn us into cockroaches as Yaldibaldi wants in his eternal Westworld. And I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. I'd like to remind them that as a trusted TV personality, uh, I can be helpful in rounding up others to toil in their underground sugar caves. Conversely, in some Gnostic texts like Thunder Perfect Mind or the Trimorphic Pretanoia, as well as her accounts as the Heavenly Eve, Sophia's manifestation is supreme and that of a savior, even a creatrix. But make no mistake, she is always incredibly abused and rejected by much of the universe, having to smuggle her tears to those who want to wake up. As April DeConnick said, The tragedy of Sophia's story is not the fall and mixture of the spirit into the psychic and material dimensions of reality, as we might expect. The tragedy is the inescapability of all of this, of a ruptured God whose unknowable nature leads to unstoppable existential damage. We are the way we are, broken, not because we have done awful things, but because God is the way God is, broken. This world you make will always be broken. Just like you. Oh, you of the broken places, you broken gods. Let us find more Tears of Sophia with our interview with Saul Luckman. As a bonus for all subs, Vance and I have a surprise as well. Yelled about. First and last, I have opened a door to the world that you had closed for all eternity. <sighs> Lift Sophia's third veil. Do not fear the flesh and do not love it. I, that have been sent from the power, and I have come to those who think about me, and I have been found in those who search for me. Accept me by your side. I am the first and the last, the honorable and the despicable, the prostitute and the respectable, the wife and the virgin, the mother and the daughter. I am the one you call life, and you have called me death. I am the light that is above all things. I am everything. Everything came out of me and returned to me. Whoever doesn't hate their brothers and sisters won't become my disciple. But whoever drinks from my mouth will know that which is hidden. This is the Aeon Bide interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Saul Luckman to discuss his novel, which I really enjoyed, Kali the Destroyer. Saul, thank you very much for coming on Aeon Bide. 
Thanks for having me, Miguel, and thanks for reading my book. Oh, it was great. I uh, I started it, and it just took me down the proverbial rabbit hole. Like I enjoyed it. I was engaged with the characters, with the story. Everything was good. Uh, in the the whole, all the reveals were just uh, an added bonus, but uh, good stuff. And with us, we have the Moondog Vance. Vance, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just fine. Looking forward to this because uh, how more basic can you get besides Archons? You know, we could almost call ourselves Archon Bite, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so, that. yeah, here we go with Raiders of the Lost Archon. Well, they are very popular. I think I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about how the Demiurge and the Archons are not the most important part of Gnosticism, but they are kind of the most uh, fascinating part. And, and and then I was thinking, well, you know, you can't have Star Wars without Darth Vader. You can't have right. the light without the shadow. So, yeah. and I think all of us, we all like the dark side, but we also are very intrigued about our own shadow and the, you know what is unconscious so i think that's what uh, but sophia is also very popular so saul tell us when did you uh get interested in uh sort of these gnostic topics gosh that's a great question i'm i'm trying to remember what year it was i'm going to say it was in the 2013 range um i was list i i I don't know, remember how I came across his work, but I got into John Lash, read uh, Not in His Image, listened to some of his other materials, and then that led to this and that. And I, you know, began learning from some other sources. There was um, uh, an astrologer named Laura Walker who was very interested in the topic, and um, she ended up uh, being a, a really a wonderful resource and help to me when I released my last novel, which is called Snooze, A Story of Awakening, which is not a Gnostic novel, but it has a lot of consciousness and other related concepts. And, you know, also dealing with sort of the shadow side and uh, that kind of thing, parallel realities, you know, what what is uh, questioning what's giving rise to, you know, this experience or, you know, whatever we want to call this realm. So uh, I learned a lot from Laura and uh, just a lot of people, really. I mean, you know, I've listened to, to your stuff. I mean, I've, I've been kind of bouncing around for a while. There's a you know, massive disagreement about so many of the basic concepts that people are calling Gnosticism. Oh, yeah. It's kind of hard to corral it all. And I don't I don't I don't um, claim to to know uh, really what's going on, but I have ideas and I like to treat reality kind of artistically from a writer's perspective you know i can i can address it i can make stories about it i can narrativize it without having to know every single thing yeah well said and i would agree i mean you could just take the gnostic aesthetic and it will take you into a world of uh dark and light experiences transcendence bliss all that you don't we don't have to worry too much about the details down here in the ground all will be revealed in our next incarnation if you know what i mean yeah, I do. I do. I mean, lately I've really been into the uh, getting into the idea of uh, simulation theory and the idea of the demiurge being a kind of, um, you know, AI system um, within which we we operate. And that instead of having, you know, reincarnations, <laughs> we have more like reboots or like <laughs> simulations or something like that. So that's another spin on it that is not, strangely, it's not actually incompatible with a lot of what I learned from older concepts about Gnosticism. No, it is. I mean, they were talking simulation theory 2000 years ago when nobody else was really talking about that, at least not in the West. So they were pioneers, and it seems to have just, uh, you might say, caught up with the world. But uh, And you find yourself leaning towards the John Lash or Sophianic Gnosticism. Maybe you can explain to the audience about what it is, a little recap. Yeah, I mean, that's just one of the, one of the many books people might be interested in. It's... Um... I mean, it's a it's a kind of uh, it's one of those books. I think you have to come to terms with one way or another if you're studying this material. He's he's pretty uh, pretty much of a force in many ways, intellectually, and um, you know he's done a tremendous amount of research. And you don't have to agree with him, but you have, like I said, you sort of have to uh, acknowledge that this uh, this elephant is in the room. And you know his his um, main thesis 
is a, a kind of literal reading of the planet as the goddess that fell from the pleroma into the kenoma. In so doing, she created the archons, kind of like our half brothers and sisters, and then came down into uh, this uh, area and became uh, the planet, and then essentially fell asleep. And we've been living kind of within her dream ever since. Um, you know, I think, I mean, some people, I, I know that um, he, years ago, he was talking about a kind of awakening period that she was in. And I don't know if, you know, where he is with that now. Is she fully awake or anything like that? I have no idea. But that was, that was, uh, that was kind of where I parted ways with Lash's material. And I haven't really checked in in several years. Yeah, and there's something about that book that sounds so truthful. It's, it's there's a feel about it, and, and again, it's so uh, cool how Sophie is this sort of, uh, well, uh, tr- I don't know what you call it. This uh, she's basically a scientist who dis- who's working on the Anthropos, and then she moves away from the Pleroma, and like you said, she comes to our galaxy and com- becomes the planet, our planet, and of course the. Uh, the other planets are the archons and all that and he's got this uh great idea too where the the archons and the demiurge are both mind parasites and they are these sort of uh galactic beings so and it works very well because again today is uh you know with paul levy's with tico and uh other uh researchers uh it seems uh the idea of a an archon as a mind virus just makes perfect sense especially when you look at how insane people are acting today right it's like there, there's no other explanation sometimes <laughs> i i would agree with that or at least you know if we have to look outside some of the prevailing materialistic paradigms i know like jason jason Bashirs, who's doing a lot of work on simulation theory his explanation for why things are so crazy is that we're approaching the end of the simulation and the simulation no longer needs to maintain any kind of narrative cohesion because we're so close to the end so it's no longer trying to cover up its tracks so that we you know won't discover kind of how to predict the simulation or what's happening it's actually letting it rip as it were as we move into the final decades of the simulation no that makes sense i mean there's almost a a feel that we're in this sort of uh yeah everything seems to be old everything seems to be rehash uh i put out a show yesterday and i put a clip from uh the infamous or famous clip from network by peter finch you know i'm as mad as hell i'm not gonna take it anymore and he's listing all the stuff that people are really scared about uh 40 years ago and of course and he's talking russians inflation crime uh and you're wondering man this is such a recycled topic i mean you go what's wrong with the lizard people don't they have a better imagination it's just the same old thing right yeah well i mean you know my take on on that whether you want to look at this as simulation or et or whatever whatever we're talking about is that you're really talking about a system that is is intelligent it is an ai of some kind or is utilizing an ai that's how you know one one way or the other but the ai itself it can't read our minds it's not and it's not creative like the anthropos like the luminous child it cannot it cannot actually create it can only maintain its programming so that's why in my estimation that it would be recycling the same things over and over again because it really recycles everything it recycles recycles calendrics cataclysmic cycles all of these things are part of the programming that its mandate is to maintain yeah that's really well said and yeah i want to bring in vance because we're getting kind of high level on the whole archon simulation what do you think vance simulation archons what's your take well yeah you know simulation really is an expression that we are our environment is an artifice that something else created our environment and you know that's the old um argument of you know creationism versus evolution or whatever and um as far as simulations go 
the um, the thing that in which the simulation is running seems to have a built-in corruption to it, right? In other words, in a simulation, you can't have uh, keep allocating memory. For example, in, in in a human simulation, a computer can't keep on allocating memory more and more and more. Eventually, you'll run out. So there has to be something called a garbage collector, <laughs> and the garbage collector kills things. <laughs> And and so uh, to to make sure there's enough memory for the new things and that seems to be you know what's happening I think um, uh, there's a uh, our, as our society evolves and you know people make connections and so forth the little inherent thing inside the system that runs the simulation starts to garbage collect this this is becoming too organized this is becoming too pat and so the destructors come in and they start garbage collecting the things that have held civilization together. And I, I think um, it's on a couple of levels too, like the level of the, you know, atoms and molecules and so forth. That's going to last a lot longer simulation wise than, than our human society and our network of individual minds. I think that's where a lot of this action and the archons operate because the archons don't seem to be deconstructing atoms or molecules. That all seems to be working the same way, right? So it's the interaction of intelligent beings that are in our vehicles. That is the realm of the archons. So in consciousness, human consciousness. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, they, they have a kind of, um, well, even just reading the narrative there is a kind of inherent fascination combined with jealousy where we're concerned, you know, so they're not going to leave us alone. We're going to have to deal with them one way or another, or, you know, maybe they've <laughs> yeah. already been dealt with. I mean, I mean, when I say the word, you know, the verb deal, I, I mean that kind of both ways. I mean, we're either going to have to somehow overcome their control or we're going to have to make peace with our shadow side that they might represent. I mean, one way or the other, they're, they're part of, you know, our uh, agenda if we are to move forward. And they're jealous too. I mean, they're afraid that if we get too organized, we will overshadow their influence. And so they have to continually work on the structures that make us able to do that so that we can't overcome them. And that happens on a lot of levels, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, even in history, look at the whole Tower of Babel scenario, you know, just exactly. Even, I mean, even if that's a metaphor, which I don't I'm not convinced that it's a metaphor, but even if it were, it's very telling, you know, it's like, oh, no, they're coming together. They're going to reach up into the sky, into our realm or, you know, into the, the consciousness level if that's somehow uh, symbolic. And uh, we can't allow this to happen. We can't allow them to come together. You know, they use divide and conquer and they did it then. That's the actually that's probably one of the great examples of divide and conquer in history yeah that would be the prime myth that's for sure and what do you think of this all uh going a little on the side if you would but when uh vance and i talked to john lamb lash i asked him do you think these forces the demiurge and the archons can be redeemed or integrated like the valentinian gnostics who thought that they were just part of the order and they would go back to the source and john was like no they will be destroyed kind of takes more of a sethian stance and for me i don't even know what to say because again uh the demiurge for all his faults he's a mis misshaped unwanted child like the sort of lost soul if you would but john of course is like no this is mechanistic it is soulless there's it's like throwing your toaster out <laughs> into the trash <laughs> what do you think uh, what do you think about that and i understand i could be projecting because i had it i was you know i had a a heart i was abused as a child so i know part of me is always going to be that wounded traumatic child that just wants to be integrated with the rest of the world yeah, you know, I, I obviously in my book, Callie the Destroyer, which is kind of a retelling of the fallen goddess scenario from a from a Lashian perspective, in many ways, uh, I, I adopt the idea that the the archons. Um, well, I don't want to say that they're necessarily to be destroyed in that in in that way of looking at things, but uh, there there is definitely a lot of conflict there, and they have to be put in their place one way or another. Um, 
I like the quote, you know, this is the, the quote from On the Origin of the World that I use as the, uh, the epigraph to my book, which is that, you know, the, the luminous child will appear and, right. and, and it will reveal and then dissolve all of their works right at the moment of their consummation. So here we are living in this kind of Baudrillardian Disneyland, right? You know, where, where it looks like the <laughs> have fully have fully accomplished what they were setting out to do, which is basically to make everything unreal and fake and upside down. Um, and so this seems to be also the moment that there's a massive awakening going on, which I've, I have said that's the, that's the revealing. But we haven't seen the dissolving yet. And one of the questions I set out to probe in Cali the Destroyer was, what does it mean to dissolve? What does it mean to destroy? Because she's the destroyer. And that's really scary. And it's Cali, you know, even though it's spelled with a C in, in, in my book, it's not the, the you know, Cali with a K. Still, you know, this is the question. What does it mean to, to get rid of this negative influence? Or, you know, is this an integration process? Is this some kind of, you know, Eastern Wu Wei situation? <laughs> yeah. Or are we in a very linear, you know, linear dogfight, uh, a, a Western battle, you know, and I don't know for sure. And then there's the question of, you know, if, if the AI, if the archons, the demiurge, you know, a lot of times those are conflated, but if that, if those beings are actually uh, the AI or inherent in the AI, well, there's really nothing to fight at all, really. I mean, it, it's there and the program is running. I think we have to work on our, in that instance, we really have to work on ourselves. Yeah, good advice, 100%. And yeah, do I, for the audience, uh, Kali the Destroyer is an excellent read. And once you get into the Gnostic vibe, it's just, it's quite a ride. And you do quote a lot of from the Nag Hammadi library. And that for me was like, ah, these cool Gnostic Easter eggs. Like, there's one scene where I think it's uh, Kali or is it Caroline who says, uh, uh, when my first wife was taken for me because she was barren, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's bringing out Thunder Perfect Mind and other parts of the book. I was like, this is a blast. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you you know, you know caught all of that. I mean, I wasn't really trying to uh, beat people over the head with that, but I was I was dropping, like you said, little Easter eggs in the text. Yeah, and and that's the interesting part too, Saul, because I'm sure you agree, but you know, and even in not in his image, uh, John has a, almost a poetic way of explaining this. It's beautiful, especially the creation myth of Sophia, this cosmic scientist, and how she falls into our galaxy and all that. But the truth is, is for some reason we humans, well, the truth is. Our brains, uh, as I keep saying, are not made of facts. They're made of narrative. For so we are this creature that we can think we're rational and we follow patterns. But stories is what is what moves us and what sticks. The movement of the myths and the archetypal images. So, if you would say, so your story for the audience is great because if you think you want to really get John's work or Gnosticism in general you'll have it in this wonderful narrative that you're engaged and you can go and things are revealed and it's excitement, but you would agree, right? Fiction just sticks more. Yeah, absolutely. I know that there's a kind of um, argument being made in a lot of uh, political science circles these days that, that news has been replaced by narrative. Right. And I'm like, when was news not narrative? <laughs> it's uh, yeah since the days of the town crier in rome during caesar's time <laughs> and i would add i would exactly and i would add science to that too that science has almost always been narrative very little of what we consider to be science has actually been proven and, and could be called if you are were strict with the word science so uh, you know we're in a bit of a we're in a bit of a postmodern world whether we like it or not and we have been for a very long time Oh, yeah, I agree with you uh, 100% about that. I mean, the Big Bang is a mythology. You need a God in the gaps. You need a, it's a cosmology to work. So that's just the way it is with the human race. And there's nothing wrong with it. If we, that's our greatest strength and we accept it, we can start, we can certainly see better through the other, all the bad narratives out there. And um, 
what's interesting too is that uh you do it is timely because you do take on the virus the v word i don't want to say it because of the <laughs> the, the the algorithms on youtube and other places uh, you call yeah. it the universal jack scene which made me chuckle but i was like wow this is, is what gordon white and i were talking about that there's going to be a genre called virus punk and you are there and i don't know if you watch westworld but in season four they went right with the v uh narrative and they went with sort of this david ike thing with you know 5g towers and this virus that can control the world i was like what the hell i know they wrote the uh the <laughs> script like years ago because they were already hinting at it in westworld 2 and 3 which was years ago i was like mm -hmm. damn they really went they had no problem being this crazy narrative and you do the same too yeah, well, I knew I have not seen that season. I saw the other seasons. Um, I thought I was done with it, but you know, people keep bringing it up now because of my book, and so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to have to go get a, a renew my subscription and go in and watch that baby. And it yeah, know? it takes a very hard gnostic turn, like season one. It goes right back to its origins, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, because season one was fascinating from that perspective, and then I felt like you know season two and three uh, what am i watching what what happened to the show <laughs> it was really really interesting but now people are saying that season four is you know is fascinating i mean what happened with me was really kind of bizarre and spiritual i i was in this was in 20 late 2019 i don't know if you know this story but i i literally received the entire plot one night as a kind of electric download the entire plot of cali the destroyer which included, you know, the whole the whole pandemic and the V and the Jack scenes and all of it. And I started writing it before it happened. Wow, yeah. <laughs> and then it would happen. And I had the whole plot that I was just kind of working my way through. So I wasn't deviating substantially from what I had received. And everything that was happening around me was what I was writing and had been in sort of instructed. I use that word sometimes instructed to write. Wow. You are the demiurge. Maybe, maybe, maybe. John was wrong. <laughs> yeah. You're right there. Yeah. You got him. <laughs> I do have a lot of demiurges. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. I think, uh, as they say, uh, fiction is autobiographical, but it also, uh, yeah it reveals the future once those channels of communication are open and like you said uh the higher worlds are just downloading shit into our brains and the archons too though that's always a problem right <laughs> yeah i think so and how to actually determine that it's it's really um i think it's i think you know one from my perspective one has to get into a question of frequency and consciousness when you go there and um there's also some really interesting stuff I discovered when I was ill from Jack scenes many years ago. I discovered um, what I think of as the kind of um, vulnerability in the human bioenergy blueprint that allows for archontic possession to happen. And I figured out how to seal it. That's great. Yeah, I've heard you say this story before, and it's great how you're able to find uh, relief and healing. And in the book, what I like, too, because I've done presentations about uh, how the Gnostics were very much into vowel magic, and they were into this vibration. I mean, it's all written in the Nagamari library, sing this, do this, and all the vowels. So you also probably agree that this sort of vowel magic or this vibrational sound thing was utilized by the Gnostics. And of course, it's very helpful today. Yes, I mean, absolutely. No doubt. I'm sure the whole, I mean, I imagine there's, there. we have only fragments, of course. So one, one can only extrapolate certain concepts, but even when they went into a ceremony and, and maybe, you know, did the standing race protocol and stood in the presence of the goddess and all of that, I'm sure there were sound components happening and things were being written down by, by a, an assistant or a partner or a scribe. So, you know, they were probably being given what I call the language of the birds following some other traditions. They were probably being given different ways of using vowels and sound for not just healing, but who knows what, you know, for gardening purposes, for protecting their uh, their settlements, for who knows what they were given. Probably very, very powerful, quote unquote, magic. 
Oh, agree a hundred percent. Yeah. We, I think there's very little we don't agree with. And sometimes, yeah, it's hard because yes, the, you have all these writings and rituals, but we don't have the original music and all that, but it is there and you can utilize it. I remember somebody telling me in my early days of Gnosticism, she said, all you need to do is uh, chant the word Iao, the word for God that you see in Gnostic gems and other mm-hmm. I I A O, and wow. just chant it any way you want. And she started chanting in the middle of this bookstore, Iao, Iao. And mm-hmm. we all kind of went into a trance. And of course, it's like, duh, this is the name of power that the Gnostics, Christians, Jews, I know that the pagans made fun of it because they thought it was a donkey sound, which <laughs> they came out with the donkey God, but just... For the audience, just sit there and go, yow, yow, you know, and find the vibration that works for you. Yeah, well, that's uh, very similar to what happened with me and my partner, Lee, when when I was really sick. And we we went on this kind of shamanic journey to Brazil, had a lot of very, very odd uh, experiences. I mean, at one point, we literally felt like we were being chased by archontic weather spirits through the streets of equatorial Brazil with with two feet of water flooding down on us. And and so it was really, really insane. um, Because at that point in time, we were, we were approaching a point where something else happened where we met some other type of spiritual beings that appeared to us as lights across the water and gave us the these vowels to sing and i was very sick at the time with a serious long long standing autoimmune illness and we received this information and we did what we were instructed to do and immediately i began healing and i had tried everything i i was i i went to brazil thinking i was probably going to die there and i said goodbye to my family thinking the same thing oh, and suddenly i'm healing and during the course of this healing process um I, we, we felt that our energy bodies were rearranging. We call this repatterning. And in in the course of this process, our, our fields and our chakras, which are kind of interrelated, recalibrated and ended up sealing what we were calling the fragmentary body, which is the, the, the second chakra, which is the sex chakra that area of the body is where I believe that the uh, our, our contact mind parasites enter us. It's where it's also the energy frequency that even like physical parasites are able to attach to and stay in our body. So for example, what will often happen with people experiencing potentiation and, and regenetics, they'll, they'll do that. They'll go for five months at which point the fragmentary bodies is sealed. And then they'll just start, visibly expelling all kinds of crazy parasites wow that's incredible and something i want to mention before we really delve into your novel and get a good backdrop on it because i feel it's important because there are people out there who want some sort of uh esoteric healing and they're like usually well damn it i can't go to brazil or i can't go to the shaman or i can't do this but listening to your podcasts and interviews something i like that you stress a lot is that this you don't need time and space for this to work right it can be non-local healing can happen across the world with the right person yeah i mean i would say that the who this work are, are receiving it remotely and it's always been that way going back you know two decades now that's awesome. And, awesome. And, and you can do it for yourself. You can, there's a, I have a book called Potentiate Your DNA. It's, it's available in various formats. It's on my Substack, uh, saulluckman.substack.com. It's on Amazon, wherever. And you need a tuning fork uh, that we sell, but it's also sold um, on Amazon and other places. So you find the tuning fork and you can just read the book and learn how to potentiate yourself. And that will actually end up sealing your fragmentary body. You can do this for friends. You can do it for pets. <laughs> you can do it for uh, family members and e- even even situations or businesses or gardens or farms or uh, anything like that. You can actually uh, essentially raise its vibrational level by offering this uh, this form of sound healing. Awesome. We'll check it out there, audience. And there are many traditions out there, too uh but again don't lose hope don't think you need to be rich to travel to some exotic place sure go for the experience but 
there's always a solution for the pain you're in, an alternative. So don't lose hope because I know a lot of people are in pain, physical, emotional, mental. There's always something out there. And if you're listening to this, it probably means you were meant to hear it. So, hmm. but uh, why don't we talk about the novel? Why don't you give us a little bit of a backdrop of uh, the the world in which Kali is, has found herself in and comes out to be as this heroine? Yeah, well, Callie, um, Callie, her name is Callie Crowell, and this is a futuristic story, so it's about 200 years in the future, and it's in a, a kind of Handmaid's Tale-esque uh, United States that's gone through um, a second American revolution in which very, um, very conservative and racist elements have taken over the society. Uh, and it's at the same time, the society is very prurient, very sexualized, uh, very Hunger Games-ish, if you will. So I'm combining s different, uh, different uh, aesthetics, different um, notions about dystopia into this world. And it's called the Fatherland. So it's no longer the United States of America. It's the Fatherland. So that's your patriarchy that has totally assumed control of the planet. And they're being obviously the patriarchy is really uh, in this instance is a is a an extension of the archons and the archontic control grid. So these these are the minions who are carrying out the archontic agenda to depopulate and control the world. And uh, so Callie is a singer. She's a famous like a rock star, and uh, she uh, ends up in um, a relationship with uh, somebody on the other side of the tracks in, in all ways. <laughs> uh, and his name is Juice. Um, and these are, we're talking teenagers here. We're talking 16, 17 year old uh, kids who are, are kind of fated to come together. And when I say fated, I, I mean that on a kind of cosmic scale as you learn uh, over the course of the book, like what, who they really are, what their real identity is, how that works. And uh, there are other, other scenarios. There's a, another world that exists that they um, become involved with um, that is not the fatherland. It's, and it's known as Tula in, um, in this book. And that's, that's inspired by some other, some other, uh, other concepts dating back in history, we could get into that. But um, <laughs> anyway, that that was a name that was it was uh, meaningful to to me that I wanted to include, and that's where the bird tribes live, and uh, they are very very interesting people. Um, I don't know what else you want me to say, Miguel. I don't want to you know totally. Yeah, it's spoil, always hard. If you have specific <laughs> questions, let me know because I I uh, you know I can drill down kind of sideways into things. Yeah, yeah, we we definitely there's so much to unpack. I don't think it would give up the the coolness and the essence. And again, your world building is uh, it's awesome. It's a grim place. Yeah, and yeah, Juice is uh, he's a minority, right? In this world, it's us again. We're going back to segregation, and minorities have less rights than whatever people deem as the proper or what white person or whatever. Yeah, they call them POCs in this world. Uh, POCs are. are persons or people of color and uh, that's a that's a real strong uh well it's a uh, legal uh term but it's also very pejorative yeah and uh, it's interesting you call it the fatherland because uh for some reason it, it always reminds me of this quote by uh philip k dick uh who uh, who told tessa dick his uh, wife at the time he said the germans may have lost the war but the nazis won it and then people go, well, yeah, well, yeah, they they went to NASA, they began, they went into intelligence in Europe and the United States. I mean, the the Nazis did pretty well, but it, even then, on a uh, more um, larger level, the truth is that things that the Nazis rep represented, eugenics, technocracy, uh, all that got really weaponized after world war ii and continues even today so your uh dystopia is actually i don't even want to say 200 years from now so it could happen sooner than that right 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have made similar comments. So they they feel that um, the novel is a kind of snapshot of of this crazy dystopian world that we we already live in. You mentioned Philip K. Dick. I, I mean, certainly one of the one of the references uh, in this book would be something like Man in the High Castle, um, mm, and yeah. you know this idea that you know the the Nazis have kind of taken over again openly you know is certainly part of where i'm coming from here and i think that's actually happening in real time we see it every day in the news i mean this is this is what's happening the these real neo nazis who are quote unquote leaders are the um you know the tip of the archontic spear and they are they are um they're doing what they're supposed to do from that oh respect. yeah mm -hmm. yeah they're following the nature of the archons it's yep simple as that i mean eugenics technocracy fascism did not start with the nazis that was already being incubated in the united states and england long before the nazis were just a good vehicle for this shit, right oh absolutely and on the, the the other thing is that we're talking about you know serious propaganda and simulated reality so you know i mean they they were the one of the first um major powers to use you know uh, cinema and as a as a as a mind control device uh and of course that evolved into uh, the, the more modern uses of television and internet you know it's just uh, it's really brilliant you know you can put that in everyone's home and then you know and every in everyone's laptops and then people are walking around with phones and watches and everything it's just really amazing how successful that that deeply archontic program has been indeed it has but it's up to us to be awake yeah and your characters are always rich in the book I like them I love how you you have a character named Matangi which is sort of a patron of mine she's sort of uh the Hermes in Hindu religion but she's a female Hermes how did oh, you yeah. choose that one well you know Lash goes into the Mahavidyas quite a bit and uh laura walker's stuff goes into that also and i just got really interested in it and um and she was kind of my my patroness also and um in many ways and um so i wanted to include her in the book and and i um i was i was happy that i figured out how to do that to make the what she does and how she is uh consistent with the way i i envisioned her and you know um the whole Hermes esque uh, aspect, you know, I that was kind of interesting that I, you know, that I was able to put some of that into her personality where she comes across as, um, you know, very quick witted and, uh, and uh, sly, but in a good way. Yeah, yeah, I was definitely, uh, I was definitely uh, very interested and attached to that character and of course uh, of course Kali is a great character her last name is that a little from Thelema well I, I, don't I was know thinking that. Crowley for some reason <laughs> yeah I mean you know there's the Crowley I, I actually just did it because of Crow that was the main reason because she's associated with Crow and so Crowell um is Crow um I mean obviously there's the you know there's Crowley in the background uh you know I'm not sure that you know you could make a case for that being anything that it was uh conscious on my part you know I I really did, don't didn't know enough about that world to incorporate it very actively I mean I've read some of that material but it, I'm it's not something I've studied very intensely no well these things just happen and uh you interact with them you experience them names characters all that so all good one of my writing teachers once said um claim everything <laughs> love it <laughs> and Vance do you have a question or what do you think so far yeah interesting uh, uh Saul you said earlier that the idea for the novel kind of downloaded to you in one night where do you think that download came from what's your idea about that yeah i think it came from the goddess i've i've uh, said that in a several several podcasts which one i feel like it came from sophia ah and who is sophia to you 
I was using a a Vlashian uh, approach to that. I feel mm. I feel like um, there's been a, a bunch of different, really funny experiences in my life where I feel that I've been very in tune with the the spirit of the planet, and that's always for me is manifested in different relationships with different kinds of birds. Oh, so, I love birds. So, so uh, to me, uh, and this is why you know Callie Crowell. It's about the crow. And uh, my first power animal was crow. I had an experience one time where I was given this, this whole healing modality by a bird sitting, this little tiny bird sitting in a tree beside me in Palm Springs. And it, it completely rocked me because it, it caused such an amazing detox for several weeks. It was like I was, I was given dynamite into my system, it was, but it was this tiny little bird. I don't even know what kind of bird it was. And it was singing and I kind of mirrored its song back to it. But I was also aware that I was actually having a conversation with the planet. Uh, and, <laughs> and it was so powerful that I, I just, I, I was just, uh, I was incapacitated for weeks. And after that, I felt like I had released something that, you know, shouldn't have been in there. And uh, I felt a lot better. Yeah, very cool. So yeah, Sophia is Gaia, and we're looking at the planet wrong, right? It's a living network of energy and power. That's that's the way I have always understood it. Now, when you get into some of the simulation stuff, so, you know that that begins to change what that might be because then you're you're still, you know, you're still in a situation where, I mean, if you're in a simulation, you're in a simulation, and even the planet is a simulation. Exactly. Now, now it might have a relationship to a real thing outside. I mean, maybe the reason that something like you know a religious text might say that we are made in the image of god is that you know that there is a there is um whatever is creating the simulation is very much like us and we look like that and that means that if there is a goddess or a, that kind of figure here then there would be something real you know something ontologically there outside the simulation that resembles or has some kind of um, uh, relationship to our notion of the planet or the goddess or Mother Earth, Gaia, Sophia, whatever you want to call her. No, makes sense. Of course, that means it's time to, for me to roll out my, well, how do we know that that isn't a simulation and how far up does it go? And maybe uh, it stops at the uh, Gnostic God above God or the, the one, the monad of the uh, Platonists or whatever where it's so inscrutable and so unknowable that it's everything everywhere all at once <laughs> to quote. Right. Tom. I mean, even the way I portray the originator in Cali, the destroyer is along those lines that there's something behind all of that, you know, that is, um, you know, is everywhere and nowhere it's, it informs everything. It is nothing, you know, um, and this, ties into even other other philosophy systems that that I've I have some familiarity with I mean even things like uh, law of one and some of that material that came through as, as channel material back in the 80s and, and in a way that reminded me of maybe some of what they might have been doing you know in their little their the little pairs going down and you know taking uh strange uh, herbs and, and receiving, <laughs> right. you know, uh, uh, channeling, you know, back in the day and then writing all that down. I mean, there's a kind of eerie similarity there, but even there you have this idea of the one infinite creator um, that, uh, you know, starts out what is in essence a massive simulation <laughs> that we are moving through, uh, where we are moving through various levels that depend on our self-actualization. And the ultimate goal of that system is to become the one infinite creator again. So you're kind of going in these massive cosmic circles. And I can definitely read Gnosticism that way as well. And simulation theory can be mapped onto that, that way of looking at things. Oh, yeah. That's uh, what the uh, cosmic ascension was all about. You know, the Greeks and the Platonists and the Gnostics and so forth, they all had their forms of it. And, you know, I, I was just realizing during uh, our conversation here that I always think of the Archons as male. I never realized that because we were talking about Gaia and we were talking about, uh, you know, the fatherland and the paternal 
type right. civilization, um, patriarchy. Um, so, um, what, what I, how about female archons? Do you uh, think there are any female archons, or are there any in the book, or well, how about that? Yeah, I mean that's a really good question. There aren't any specifically described in the book, but I'm not saying that there aren't any. I mean, I really don't know. I have no idea. I describe them as somewhat androgynous in the book, uh, except yeah. for the Lord Archon, who has a, a real strong male energy. Yeah, solar. Of course, in Hindu uh, mythology, Kali is the destroyer, right? Then, you know, she's the one with all the arms and goes around. Uh, she's uh, uh, very destructive. Yes, yes. And I like to point out, because people like to bring that up, you know, because this book is about that figure in many ways. Um, in fact, she meets her <laughs> her forebear at one point, who is actually named Kali with a, Kali with a K, and, and embodies that that uh, that particular Mahavidya energy. Um, where was I going with this? Um, oh, that the 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 notion of destruction is is intimately tied to the concept of regeneration. We're talking breakdown and breakthrough. So Kali is really a natural process that uh, in many ways can be uh, looked at as, um, you know, some kind of seasonal change or, you know, tilling the earth that allows uh, growth to occur. You know, it's not necessarily a bad evil thing that we're looking at in that figure. Yeah. But it doesn't care is the point. So if the Kali decides to take her weapons and apply them to a conscious being or, or a civilization or you know a society or something like that that's a different thing and uh, i was telling miguel before the interview uh, that i think that's the the key element that it's the creation destruction all that it's not really a big deal until the things that are being destroyed are suffering because of their destruction right right you know i know that uh, i mean I, I hate to keep talking about this but it's been something i've been studying a lot lately so if we're living in a kind of uh, simulation that has these cataclysm cycles then we're you're what you're describing is um is a very accurate description of the actual simulation not of like a kali figure but of the simulation of the program itself which doesn't care uh who who gets hurt but at the same time a lot of it appears that a lot of these cataclysmic cycles, um, even when they're really severe, you end up with a lot of people surviving and going on to create new civilizations and, and new works of art and that kind of thing. And, you know, I, I believe that there is a kind of uh, discernment that's happening uh, from the, if we do in fact live in a simulation, that the simulation is kind of discerning of where we are in our development. And for people who are at a certain, I don't know if you want to call it a frequency, a consciousness level, whatever, it tends to leave them alone. So, um, you know, it's, it's not as if we're just victims of these things all the time. And I think you two are wrong with the stuff about birds and all that. I mean, we all know that birds aren't real. They're CIA robots, <laughs> right? So That's, right. My... That's right. That's right. That's right. Because I was I keep... to a bird in the background. <laughs> I have somebody sitting next to me that disagrees with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, when my cat walks around with a bird from outside, I'm like, oh, all those metal and wire. Let go of it, you dumb animal. So, but... You know, it is what it is. That's great. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love all the bird stuff. I have a painting I did years ago called Bluebird Shaman. It's one of my favorite paintings. It's a watercolor. It's on my wall right now. And it's just a kind of shamanic figure with arms outstretched that are way too long to be human that are like looking, looks like they're kind of morphing into bluebird uh, wings. And um, I just love this idea that we can use. Uh, you know, our animal teachers to, to fly in various ways. Yeah, that is true very much. And another symbol that's very important in your book is that of the rose. You, you talk about the rose, every chapter has a design of the rose. Maybe could you tell the audience why this symbol is important in your work or this particular work? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, why? I don't know exactly why, because I don't even like roses that much. But I, fe I feel like <laughs> um, 
that that somehow this was this came through at, in in the plot when I was given the plot as as a, a representation of of uh, Sophia, and I, I was meant to use that in a way that would um, would you know evoke some aspect of her. And obviously, when you end up traveling to Tula and you meet the bird tribes, there's a even a, a greater relationship there uh, that those people have with with uh, the rose it's all it's in all their symbolism they have it's a, a title for a, one of their leaders so you know it becomes very very important and, and it kind of just works its way through the text and i felt like it was you know we talked about john lash and a certain degree of poetry in his work even though he's conveying all of this factual material and i wanted to have you know some motifs that would really resonate and would take on greater significance through a process of accretion. And I think the rose imagery in this book does that to some degree. Any connection with the rose accretions, perhaps? I mean, maybe, maybe. Uh, not not like I was planning that. I mean, obviously, um, that's an easy, um, that's an easy uh, connection to make, but it would be hard for me to say, you know, here's <laughs> a definite connection that I meant uh, back to, you know, to that, that group of people. Well, I mean, it's downloaded, right? Well, so maybe whoever sent you the material kind of embedded that symbol in there. Absolutely. From, well, you, you certainly know. have the idea of, um, you know, all the Black Madonna stuff and the Mary Magdalene stuff and the connections that one could uh, make to the notion of a goddess, um, you know, all of that could be in there at some point. You have a cross in there anywhere? Are there cross symbols in, in the novel? Well, Christianity is still the religion. So yes, um, it's a it's a it's a religion that has actually brought the demons out of the closet and put them front and center. But but you don't you all, you only know that if you know what you're looking for. So there's a foregrounding of Moloch in in the text. And so that'll yet, be a shadow type of aspect then. Yes, yes, uh, definitely. Um, and also, um, you know, what is the nature of the demiurge? You know, what are we actually, you know, and what is the what is the relationship between the demiurge and, you know, the God of the Old Testament, for example? There's a couple aha moments there where, you know, Callie uh, realizes what she's actually seeing and hearing, and it's pretty horrific. So for the audience, and of course, I will have this on the show notes, where can people find out more about you and your work or where do you want to take them? Sure. Well, come over to my sub stack. That's kind of where I'm putting out a lot of content uh, content these days. And that's uh, saulluckman.substack.com. And that's going to have links to my, you know, my entire uh, sphere of influence such as it is online. Well, there you have it. And uh, are you working on any new books? Uh, I am. I'm uh, in the process of releasing a um, a humorous uh, and somewhat philosophical memoir called Musings from a Small Island, and it's, uh, it's self-illustrated with my paintings. And so that's going to have about well over 100 paintings in it, and I'm going to re uh, release those in color so that it's kind of like a coffee table book, but one with a story. Mm. That's uh, that's one, one project, and I'm re-releasing my first novel, uh, it's called Beginner's Luke, and it's about a guy going around imagining himself into existence. Oh, wow. Very cool. And and uh, Kali, the story has been well received so far, right? Yeah, yeah. You can go go read the reviews on Amazon. And, you know, there, there are more reviews than other places like Goodreads. Sometimes people only post in one place, and I've, I've posted some on the site. Yeah, a lot of good feedback. Uh, it's sold pretty well. It's not to snooze his level yet, um, but it's only... Just now, it's been out for not quite a year, I think. So, you know, I, someone uh, someone once said that a, a good book will find its level. You know, it'll it will eventually settle in on its own merits, and I've seen that happen with my work. And you know, I know that it's just a, a it's a time game. Yes, it is, especially today in this era where it just you don't get one publishing and it's over. There's no such thing as one window of opportunities. Things can move organically. And your nonfiction book is Conscious Healing, right? For the That's, audience. That was my first one. And then I, that was followed up with Potentiate Your DNA. Mm -hmm. 
which if you're really interested in the regenetics material, that may be where to start because that's the how-to book. Awesome. Well, check it out, guys. Uh, good stuff, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but we are we are definitely at the end, uh, Vance. Uh, thanks for keeping us company. Oh, absolutely. It's been fun, and it's all good luck with the book. Hopefully you, the Archons won't uh, try to, you know, it's advertising for them. So you'd think they'll uh, help you along with the sales. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they actually gave me a contract and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to hit up the Illuminati for further funding for the second right. edition. And thank you too, Miguel. I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. And we definitely look forward to the next time we talk. Let's do it. And there you have it, Saul bringing us the sunlight of powerful Gnostic myths. In our second part, Saul will discuss esoteric symbolism and more on Sophia. He'll expand on many of the characters in his book. We'll all share our favorite Gnostic books of different genres, as well as our favorite conspiracy theories, and authors and artists too and much more. As mentioned in the intro, and as a bonus, Vance and I talk about the Archons and their different aspects as a counterbalance to Sophia. Very cool content. So please become a member for the full revelation. It's only $6.99 a month for AB Prime or $4.99 at Red Circle or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. For AB Prime members and higher level patrons, you'll get access to my private Facebook group and Discord. If you find value in this content, please support this Red Bill Cafeteria. Your help can be in the form of some shekel donations to PayPal or the US Mail or any other provider you can think of. There is also a link on the show notes if you want to leave a tip via Stripe now. I also have the merch store and an Amazon wish list. Consider joining the Finding Hermes program, where we have bi-monthly meetings on Gnostic practices and rituals, as well as some cool Q&As. I'm also on Rockfin or Odyssey if crypto is your bag. If you need help with any of these choices, just message my ass. I'm always here to help, and I truly appreciate your help. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always. <laughs>